Welcome to LG Path Labs monthly pathology webinar series. Today we have Dr. Ipshita Kak with us, who is a consultant histopathologist at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. She'll be talking about salivary gland pathology today. Welcome, Dr. Ipshita. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for the introduction. So as Dr. Gupta mentioned, uh, today I'm going to be discussing the use of immunohistochemistry in salivary gland pathology. And um, we're going to discuss this by looking at some case-based examples and also discuss some challenges that can occur with some of these common entities. So I would like to start with normal anatomy and histology. So beginning with the major salivary glands, we'll start with the parotid. The parotid is actually in this preauricular area where it's bounded by uh, the sternocleidomastoid posteriorly, anteriorly it's bounded by the masseter, and superiorly by the zygomatic arch. The Stenson's duct opens into the buccal mucosa. And in terms of normal histology, as we all know, the parotid is predominantly serous asini, as we can see here. There are rare mucous asini that are still present, but I wanted to take some time to explain the ductal normal histology. So the smallest ducts that occur in within the lobules are actually the intercalated ducts, and it can actually be difficult to identify them at this power, but you can see them here as very, very small ducts. The next size up is actually the striated ducts, which you see here with the columnar eosinophilic epithelium. You can see it here as well. And the largest ones are actually the excretory ducts, where you can identify that there is actually a second layer at the base of these ducts as well. The reason why I'm highlighting these is that the acinar epithelial cells, as well as the smallest ducts, the intercalated ducts, are actually lined by myoepithelial cells, whereas the striated ducts and the excretory ducts are lined by basal cells. This becomes important when we actually look at immunohistochemistry, so just to highlight that here. Moving on into the submandibular gland, in terms of the anatomy, it's located in the submandibular triangle, right under the angle of the mandible, bounded anteriorly by the anterior belly of digastric and posteriorly by the posterior belly. In terms of the normal histology, the most characteristic finding of the submandibular gland is actually something called serous demilunes. And these are basically caps of serous asini over mucous asini. So this is quite characteristic. The rest of the ductal morphology remains the same in all the major salivary glands. Here is a picture demonstrating the relationship between the sublingual and the sub mandibular gland. So here you can see the sublingual gland opening up through numerous little ducts into the base of the tongue, whereas the submandibular gland has the Wharton's duct opening singularly in the base of tongue. And as we all know, the sublingual gland is predominantly mucus, almost 65%, with the rest being serous asini. This uh, picture is just demonstrating the relationship of the three major salivary glands. So the parotid gland preauricular, the submandibular gland under the angle of the mandible, and the sublingual gland just beneath the tongue. In addition to these, we have numerous minor salivary glands, about 800 to 1,000 of them, lining the entire oral cavity and the upper aerodigestive tract. Each of these glands has exactly one duct. And although they contain both serous and mucous asini, their secretions are mainly mucus. The biggest difference between these and the major salivary glands is that they are not encapsulated by connective tissue, but just surrounded by some loose connective tissue. This table uh, from this paper is actually extremely important in understanding immunohistochemistry and salivary gland neoplasms, uh, but we first begin with normal salivary glands. So as you can see, all the ductal or the epithelial cells, so the luminal cells of all the ducts, as well as the acinar epithelial cells, are positive for CK7 and CAM5.2. But as you notice, the basal cells and the myopithelial cells are also weakly positive for these two markers. Specifically related to the basal cells, the markers that we use are CK5-6, 34BE12, and P63. And you can see that these can also be positive in myopithelial cells. And myopithelial cells are specifically highlighted by myoid markers, such as caponin, SMA, SMMHC. 
as well as S100 and Bimentin. So we'll see a picture of this uh, when we go through all of these um, immunohistochemical expressions. So beginning with CK7, you can see the strong ductal or luminal expression of CK7 in this large excretory duct, and you can see it as well as in the striated ducts. Um, you can also appreciate that the lining of the acinar epithelial cells is also weakly highlighted by CK7. Here, P63 is highlighting both the basal cells that are located in the base of the excretory ducts, as well as the striated ducts, but also the myoepithelial cells that are lining the acini, as well as the intercalated ducts. The S100 and the SMMHC both help highlight the myoepithelial cells. So um, you can see with the S100 highlighting some of the smaller intercalated ducts, their myoepithelial cell layer. And the SMMHC really nicely um, highlights the rimming of the acinar uh, epithelial cells by the myoepithelial cells. You can see here that the excretory duct um, is negative. And uh, just for an internal control, you've got a blood vessel here as well. So moving on to the WHO classification, um, as we all know, the WHO divides salivary gland tumors into benign and malignant and other epithelial lesion. And most of these entities we are familiar with. The two things I wanted to highlight was uh, nomenclature change. So the old terminology of polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma or PLGA has now been replaced by polymorphous adenocarcinoma or PAC. And the old terminology of mammary analog secretory carcinoma has now been replaced by just secretory carcinoma. Okay, so after that, let's go through some case-based examples. So starting with case one, and I've called this the simple case, but you know sometimes it can be challenging. So I had a 50-year-old male with a slowly enlarging mass in the left preauricular area. The CT showed a well-demarcated lesion in the tail of the parotid. The clinician decided to do an FNA for diagnosis. So this is what I received on the FNA, and you can see that there is a bluish um, purple look um, to this matrix that's present. And even in this power, you can uh, notice that there are some clusters of cells that are present within this matrix. At a higher power, you can see that these clusters are made of cohesive epithelial cells, as well as discohesive single myoepithelial cells. And with all of those three components, we have uh, the diagnosis of pleomorphic adenoma. So as we know, this is the most common salivary gland neoplasm, with the parotid being the most common site. It's a slowly growing neoplasm, but it can recur in less than 2% or 2.5% of cases. And malignant transformation named carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma can be seen in up to 10% of cases. So this is um, a resection of the same lesion. And again, you can identify that you know, there's readily identifiable three elements of the chondromyxoid matrix, which appears a little pale, of the epithelial or ductal elements, and the myoepithelial cells, which are spindled here as well. So myoepithelial cells by far are uh, the most notorious in terms of their divergent histology. So they can be stellate, spindled, um, clear, plasma cytoid, epithelioid, and that's what can make it quite challenging sometimes to diagnose these neoplasms or any other neoplasms associated with myoepithelial cells. In terms of immunohistochemistry, most of us, uh, when we have the three typical features, either on an FNA or on a biopsy or resection, do not re really require immunohistochemistry to make this diagnosis. But um, in tough cases, trying to highlight the different components of this neoplasm can be helpful in coming up with the diagnosis. In terms of molecular, the major cytogenetic abnormalities that can be seen in pleomorphic adenoma are rearranged mirac rearrangements or abnormalities of PLAG1, HMGA2, and in about 30% of cases, the carrier type can actually be normal. The biggest question I think uh, most of us think about or get is when to consult for a pleomorphic adenoma. Pleomorphic adenoma, as the name suggests, can actually have a lot of different histological pictures. So you can occasionally get capsular invasion. You can even get occasional perineural invasion. We all know about the benign metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma. 
You can, again, see necrosis as well, especially in a post-FNA setting, and occasionally see mitosis. But if you see any of these features in conjunction with each other, so more than one feature, or they're frequent, so you're getting frequent capsular invasion, frequent perineural, lots of vascular invasion, extensive necrosis with no history of a previous procedure, lots of mitosis, and especially if you see a second population of identifiable cells that look high grade or malignant compared to the rest of the pleomorphic adenoma elements, which have increased nuclear atypia, these are the situations in which I would suggest a consultation to a head and neck pathologist. Okay, so moving on to case number two, which I've named the case of the multifocal tumor. This was a 55-year-old male, a smoker, with slowly enlarging preauricular ma mass. The CT showed multiple lesions in the parotid gland, but also in the neck lymph nodes, and the radiologist actually called this suspicious for lymphoma. The clinician decided to do a parotidectomy with a neck dissection. So here on low power, we've got uh, benign salivary gland tissue in the background and you can identify even at this power that there seems to be some um, cysts lined by eosinophilic appearing epithelium at least at this power and the background shows a lot of lymphocytes with germinal centers. A higher power demonstrates this, that this epithelium is actually oncocytic and bilayered um, and so with that and the presence of the lymphocytes and germinal centers in the background, most of us would be able to make the diagnosis of Warthin's tumor. Now, this is the second most common benign salivary gland neoplasm. It almost exclusively involves the parotid gland. I mentioned uh, the history of um, smoking because there is a strong link between that and this neoplasm. Warthin's, as we know, is actually the most common bilateral tumor and also extremely common multifocal. So I've given the percentages there. And generally, you need complete surgical excision for these lesions. Where it can get challenging is this um, situation which I've shown here. So again, you've got uh, what looks like oncocytic bilayered epithelium in some cystic format. Um, you've got lymphoid tissue with germinal center in the background. But here you've actually got a capsule covering all of this um, tissue. And so I can tell you that this was actually in one of the neck lymph nodes that was taken out as the neck dissection. So this can be challenging because typically if we see some epithelial elements in a lymph node, we're thinking metastases. But in the case of Warthin's, this is actually a well-described entity by the name of multicentric Warthin's tumor. And it can typically mimic a tumor metastatic to a lymph node. So it is not uncommon in Warthin's to actually get neck lymph nodes with um, uh, inclusions or uh, nests of what looks like Warthin's tumor in the neck lymph nodes. And the reason that's given for this is that the neck lymph nodes actually have benign salivary gland inclusions present in them quite commonly. And so the Warthin's tumor is thought to be arising within those benign salivary gland inclusions in the lymph nodes. So if you get a case like this, now you know what this entity is. And as long as it looks like a typical Warthin's, that's all it is. In terms of something that can be a little bit more challenging than the multicentricity is actually this phenomenon. So you can see on uh, low power that you're actually getting a lot of necrotic debris in that cystic area. And the lining now appears to be squamoid with some fibrosis. Here you've got still background mixed inflammatory cells. You even got some macrophages and uh, some nests of squamous or squamoid cells seem to be present in the stroma as well. In other regions of the cystic area, you see what otherwise looks like a typical Warthin's. So this is actually something that's called by the name of metaplastic Warthin's or in fact infarcted Warthin's. And this can occur post FNA radiation or infarction due to any other cause. And the most common type of metaplasia that occurs in this setting is actually squamous metaplasia. So you can see it's quite common in up to 35 to 70% of cases. And in about 7%, it can actually be quite extensive. You can also see mucinous metaplasia in, as a result of the infarction in about 2 to 27% of cases. And so to differentiate this metaplastic phenomenon from other differential diagnoses, and usually the most common differential is a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. 
is that you have to find areas of typical oncocytic bilayered epithelium. So while that is actually easier in a resection specimen, sometimes in a biopsy specimen that can actually be quite challenging. And so um, I typically end up getting deepers just to see if I can identify some of those areas or see some of those areas with the typical Wharton's look. Okay, I'll now move on to case three and four. And uh, I present them together because they can actually look alike um, in a lot of different uh, ways. So here we've got the history of both of them. So case three was a 60-year-old female with a tongue-based mass that was noticed a year ago, presented with facial numbness, and the CT showed an infiltrative mass. Whereas case four was also a 60-year-old female with a hard palate mass that was noticed a year ago. She complained of ill-fitting dentures, and the CT again showed an infiltrative mass. So we have biopsies of both of these cases. And for case three, you can see on low power that you've got squamous mucosa with underlying basaloid-looking cells that are arranged in tubules and occasionally fusing together maybe to form an early crib reform. And uh, within these uh, nests of basaloid cells, you get this basement membrane-like basement membrane-like material that's present, as you can see. And if you move on to case four, again, you see that you've got squamous mucosa with underlying, again, very blue-looking basaloid cells in uh, tubular and other patterns. And when you look into these cells, you notice that compared to case three, they have a little bit more cytoplasm. And uh, in terms of the nuclear morphology, it appears to be more monotonous or the nuclei look a lot like each other in this neoplasm compared to here, where they're a little bit more angulated and irregular looking. So we delve into immunohistochemistry, as we've recently learned, and P63 here um, in both of the neoplasms seems to highlight the basal slash myoepithelial cell layer. And you can see that here with a nice internal control of the squamous mucosa. Same thing for case four. And uh, in the main differential of basaloid neoplasm is adenoid cystic carcinoma and polymorphous adenocarcinoma. And uh, there's quite a bit of recent literature talking about secret expression in adenoid cystic carcinomas. So you've read that and you decide to do the secret and you see that, yes, there is actually quite a uh, nice secret expression in this tumor as well as in case four. So you think that maybe you're dealing with actually the same type of neoplasm. But then you move on to P40, which uh, we'll talk about in just a minute. And you notice that while in case three, P40 looks identical to the P63, both on low and high power. In case four, um, you can see that the um, internal control of the squamous mucosa is positive, but the neoplasm is actually completely negative, And you can appreciate that further on the high power. So here you've actually got the first clue that this may not be the same neoplasm between case three and four. Just a quick word on P63 and P40. So P40 is actually an antibody that recognizes a very specific P63 isoform that is more specific to true myoepithelial cell differentiation. Um, polymorphous adenocarcinomas that do not actually harbor a myoepithelial component in comparison to their typical differential for basaloid neoplasms, that's adenoid cystic carcinoma and pleomorphic adenoma, are therefore negative for P40. So this um, uh, immunophenotype of being P63 positive, but P40 negative, which is called discordant immunophenotype, is actually relatively specific for polymorphous adenocarcinoma. And it can be extremely helpful when you've got you know, limited material like in biopsy or in cytology. Much better and much um, more useful than actually CKIT. Because as you saw, CKIT can actually be expressed in about 40% of polymorphous adenocarcinomas. Although it's not usually as strong or diffuse as in adenoid cystic carcinomas, it can be expressed. And therefore, CKID is not actually as useful in that difference uh, or differential as is this discordant immunophenotype of P63 and P40. And this is the resection of case four. And you can see that while the surface looks very similar to the biopsy that we had received, deeper in the area of the lesion, you can actually identify the targetoid perineural invasion that is characteristic of uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma. 
And here are just uh, more pictures showing, you know, the very prominent whirling around uh, the nerves that is demonstrated by this neoplasm. So as you know by now, case three is an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Um, these are known to have um, translocation of 6-9, resulting in a MIB-NFIB fusion. The five-year survival rate for adenoid cystic carcinoma is good, but the 20-year survival rate is actually very poor. These are relentless neoplasms that have recurrence and infiltration. In contrast, case four, which we now know as a polymorphous adenocarcinoma, actually in 75% of cases has a very distinct molecular phenotype that's different from its lookalike, which is recurrent hotspot activating mutations in PRKD1 and somatic rearrangements in PRKD1, 2, and 3. And the most important reason to distinguish these two is actually the prognosis. Polymorphous adenocarcinoma has excellent long-term prognosis. It's 96% 10-year disease-specific uh, survival in comparison to something like 20 to 50% for adenoid cystic carcinoma. So we do want to differentiate these neoplasms as best as we can because it makes a huge difference uh, for the patient. And then while we're along the track of basaloid neoplasms, I wanted to um, show you this case, which demonstrates that sometimes uh, if we get tunnel vision based on our clinical and radiological colleagues, uh, that sometimes we can end up uh, making a misdiagnosis or maybe missing an entity. So this was a 65-year-old female with a large preauricular mass. The CT showed a widely infiltrative parotid mass with extensive lymphadenopathy, pleural-based mass, and even some circumferential distal esophageal thickening. So the clinical and radiological impression was of a high-grade primary salivary gland neoplasm with metastases. There was an FNA done at an outside institution that was called basaloid neoplasm. Um, I didn't uh, receive the slides for that, so I don't have those pictures. The clinician, though, decided to do an urgent core biopsy for a more definitive diagnosis. And so you can see here that we've got a core biopsy of this lesion. And yes, indeed, it looks like a basaloid ne neoplasm. In fact, sheets of extremely blue looking cells um, on low power. And when you look at medium power, you uh, notice the same thing, except that there seems to be very scant cytoplasm. And on higher power, there is a hint of uh, loosely cohesiveness or discohesiveness. They don't really uh, seem to be forming nests or groups or um, really any sort of distinctly cohesive structures. Um, here we can also identify a easily identifiable mitosis. And so with the clinical and radiological impression of primary salivary gland malignancy, you decide to first start with cytokeratins. And you can see in this um, picture here that you're, um, there is some normal salivary gland elements that are present here, which are highlighted really nicely as the internal control. But this was the expression of all cytokeratins that were performed on this case, so cytokeratin A1, A3, CK7, and CAM5.2 were all negative in the actually uh, basaloid cells. And you decide to do an S100 as well, just to see if this is a funny looking myopithelial cell neoplasm. And again, other than the rare uh, positive testing in the malignant cells, um, you're basically just highlighting the background. So that is also largely negative. You go back to the h &E and you notice again that these cells look very discohesive in sheets uh, with uh, scan to no cytoplasm, and therefore you decide to expand by doing lymphoma markers. And this is your CD20. The CD10 has a very similar expression to CD20, and KI67 is in the range of 65 to 70%. And therefore, this is actually a diffuse large piece of lymphoma of the salivary gland. Now, primary lymphomas of the salivary gland are not common. Um, they account for only about 5 to 10% of cancers in the salivary gland. Of them, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common. Typically occurs more commonly in the parotid than uh, the other salivary glands. Um, FNA is known to be very challenging uh, with these neoplasms uh, with low sensitivity. And while core needle biopsy is better, frozen section is actually best uh, to demonstrate the discohesive morphology with 95% uh, sensitivity and specificity. So this was um, just a case to demonstrate that sometimes, again, um, you know, the uh, 
clinical and radiological impression can really tunnel vision us into thinking of primary salivary gland neoplasms only, but uh, this slide doesn't lie. And uh, if we have features for something else, then uh, we can work it up and actually come to the diagnosis. So I'll end here and uh, ask Dr. Gupta if um, she has any questions for me. Um, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Ipshita, for the lovely presentation. Please, can you tell us how you approach uh, salivary gland biopsy in your practice? Thank you for the question, Dr. Gupta. So in my practice, um, the biopsies, I basically divide them based on the reason that the clinician has performed the biopsy. So starting off with benign entities, one of the most common uh, biopsies that we receive is that of the lower lip for Sjogren syndrome. And for these biopsies, the first thing to do is to actually measure the salivary gland fragments that you've received and the area of those. Um, because if it's less than four millimeters square, it's actually an insufficient biopsy. If it's more than four millimeters square, then I actually look for uh, foci of inflammatory cells. And a focus is defined as at least 15 inflammatory cells. And these can be any inflammatory cells, not just lymphocytes. Um, and then I count the number of these foci that I have for that um, area of the um, salivary gland biopsies and uh, do a calculation to get the focus score per four millimeter square, report that along with the chisel mason grading. So that's how I deal with um, children to know. In terms of if the clinician is trying to actually target a lesion or a mass, I divide it into three categories uh, depending on the clinical history, the radiological findings, and my own histological findings. And so for the first category, which I label benign, um, the history is typically that of a extremely slow growing mass and the patient doesn't have any other symptoms other than the mass itself. The radiology typically shows a wall segment scribe lesion. Um, and on histology, um, usually you've got apparent features of either a pleomorphic adenoma or a Warthin's tumor, and occasionally less common entities like a basal cell adenoma or a myopithelioma. For the next category, which I term intermediate um, entities, uh, the clinical history is typically that, again, of a slow-growing mass. But uh, usually now the patients start having symptoms such as facial numbness or other symptoms of perineural invasion. And um, on the radiology, these can be either well circumscribed masses still or infiltrative masses. And uh, on the histology, I divide them into three groups depending on the predominant cell type that's seen in the biopsy. So if that is um, basaloid cells, then it's the differential of the basaloid neoplasms that we've um, already discussed, uh, being mainly of adenoid cystic carcinoma, polymorphous adenocarcinoma, and rarely pleomorphic adenoma. In terms of um, oncocytic uh, differential, that typically includes a cynic cell carcinoma, uh, oncocytoma, and oncocytic carcinoma. Uh, there is an oncocytic variant of mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and uh, occasionally metaplastic Warthin's tumor. And then finally, um, the clear cell differential. Um, in that, uh, I typically include um, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, epithelial, myopithelial carcinoma, myopithelial carcinoma by itself, um, and clear cell carcinoma. So that rounds out um, the intermediate category. And then there's a third category, which I label high-grade or overtly malignant category. And the typical clinical history is of a rapidly growing mass uh, with the... Um, a lot of patient symptoms at this stage, and either this mass has arised de novo or completely new, or it's been in the background of a previously slow-growing mass. Um, the radiology typically shows an infiltrative mass, and uh, the histological uh, features are usually overtly malignant. So there's lots of necrosis, easily identifiable mitoses, apoptosis. Um, the malignant cells are overtly high grade with a lot of nuclear ATP and pleomorphism. And uh, the typical differential in this case includes carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, um, salivary duct carcinoma, and high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. 
So uh, in terms of use of immunohistochemistry in my practice, as we all know, most salivary gland neoplasms are quite characteristic looking histologically. And um, therefore, if you have a characteristic looking entity, you don't um, necessarily need uh, immunohistochemistry, except in some rare entities. But typically, I use immunohistochemistry when there is a closed differential in any of those intermediate categories or to confirm my diagnosis in the high grade um, category. I hope that answers your question. Thank you again. Many thanks, Dr. Abhishek, for such a lovely and informative presentation. If our viewers have any questions, please leave the questions in the comment box and Dr. Ipshita Kak will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Ipshita.